Good morning. My name is Sean Castle, and uh, uh, your professor Matt Miller asked me to come down and, and do a presentation for you guys um, on mobile forensics, is what we're going to specifically talk about this morning. Mobile forensics is specific on mobile devices. Tablets, cell phones, smaller PDAs, GPS devices, things like that you can take with you in the car, put in your pocket. Okay? It's not going to cover laptops, not going to cover desktops, not going to cover servers. We're specifically focusing on iOS, Android, and uh, other embedded type applications. Okay? Who all has a cell phone? Everybody? Everybody got a cell phone? Okay, Android, put your hand. Apple, put your hand. Okay, good, that works. Um, kind of a healthy mix between the two. Um, I'm going to go over what maybe some differences are between the mobile platforms, the type of information you can get out of it, um, privacy concerns that you guys might have and probably should think about, and ways to defend that. Um, some basic low-level understanding of maybe the legal application of when it's okay um, to, to take a device and when it's not okay to take a device. Um, those types of things. So we're going to dive right into it. <clears throat> One of the tools that I use in the field to collect forensic information off of a cell phone is a cell right. Okay, It's a specific tool built by a company, an Israeli-owned company, for the purposes of pulling data off of cell phones. They've been around for a while, and they've gone through a few revisions of their tools. Um, obviously, back in the day when you had non-smart phones and you're dealing with flip phones and you had all the weird style connectors that you needed to uh, hook them up to, um, this bag comes with those. So if you want to come up later um, or I can send this around, uh, you can see all the different type of phone connections. If you guys have had phones for a while, you know that it hasn't always been just a straight USB adapter. Sometimes they change the cabling and the pinouts and all that kind of fun stuff. So this bag includes a, a kit of all the cables that I might need to hook up to phones that I would run across in the field. So base understanding. When you're dealing with digital forensics, you want to have the concept somewhat like a doctor has a Hippocratic Oath of do no harm. You want to disturb as little information as possible in order to pull all of the data off the phone. Okay? So typically one of the first things you do when you get a phone that you want to capture the information off of, put it in airplane mode. What does putting a cell phone in airplane mode do? Anybody? Turns off all that information, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular. Yep, correct. Turns off the radios. Okay. Um, why would you want to turn off the radios if you're pulling information off of the phone? Why, don't, why might that be important? If it's connected to a network, is it possible that things could change while you were working on it? What if that call would receive a message? What if that phone would receive, sorry, what if the phone would receive a call? What would happen if the phone would receive a message? Or, here's an interesting scenario. You have an application for locate my phone, turned on your device, correct? Okay, you want to know where it's at in case you lose it? What if someone takes your phone that you don't want to have it, and you send an erase code to it. I'm trying to pull the data off the phone because I suspected that you may be doing something bad with it. I sure don't want you to send a, a, lock, a lock or an erase code to it while it's in my hand. Okay? Another reason you might want to put it in airplane mode, um, you probably wouldn't want the owner of the phone showing up to where you are at um, while you're capturing it. So for example, um, lawyers hire me to help them in custody and divorce cases. Okay? I probably don't want the husband or the wife who is mad that I have their phone showing up at my laboratory and screaming at me. So probably another good reason to turn the GPS or radio off so that you have um, a little more, a little more hidden. Okay. So you walk up to a phone and you know that you have permission to touch the device and pull the contents from inside of it, first thing you do is what? Open it up. Okay. Well, this one's locked. I can't get into it. 
I'm going to get that. The encryption and security that's capable on these modern devices, during the process of interview with the person that you're working with, you need to get that passcode. Because depending upon the software and the firmware revision working on your phone, I may or may not be able to circumvent it with my cell brand. Okay? Two or three years ago, it was very easy to circumvent most of the security on any phone out there. Okay? If you had a swipe code, if you just had a number code on your Android device or Apple device, there was a distinct possibility that that meant absolutely nothing to me. I could get right underneath your passcode and get at everything in your phone. Okay? Now, with the advent of increased privacy and security from the vendors, like Samsung and Apple, it makes that more difficult. Okay? Apple and Samsung are encrypting their devices by default. And when you do a factory reset, you're not actually erasing the file system, but you're deleting the cryptographic key that's responsible for the information on that phone. Everybody with me so far? Okay, good. Track it. All right. So, we grabbed the phone. We managed to get the unlock code from the user. So we're going to go ahead and unlock the phone. And the next thing we're going to do is place it into airplane mode. Now, I will not receive any calls. Hopefully, we'll not receive any SMS messages. And the phone shouldn't be talking to the outside world. Now, how many of you have an Apple device that have been keeping up on the news about Apple and iOS updates? Okay. Did you read the article that airplane mode maybe doesn't turn the radios off? You saw that article too? Yeah. So those are things to be concerned about. How do you circumvent that? If I want this phone to stop broadcasting to the outside world, and airplane mode may or may not correctly turn the radios off, what would be my next option? Isolate the phone? How would I isolate the phone? Any ideas? Awesome. Faraday cage. All right? You guys are paying attention. I like this. So in the field, when I run into that scenario, I carry a Faraday bag with me. All right? I'm going to pass this around. It's got my business cards in it. Uh, <clears throat> you want to describe what my contact Faraday information. Cage is? What's that? Do you want to describe what that is? Yes, I will. Um, a Faraday bag is a specially lined fabric that will stop RF frequency from escaping. Okay, what's RF frequency? Anybody know what RF is? Radio frequency? Okay. Radio frequency is the energy that's broadcasting off the antennas in your cell phone, whether it be GPRS, CDMA, LTE, 802.11b, and it's all RF. Alright? When you feel this bag and you open it up, it looks kind of shiny inside. And that's because the material is woven with copper. Okay? So it's like a copper mesh bag. And that'll, that stops the radio frequency from escaping the bag. So what you would do after you've placed the phone in airplane mode and documented the user lock code, Somebody want to go ahead and dial 402? You got a phone handy? I, I, have, I should have you. Yeah. Awesome. Yours? Yeah, go ahead and call me. <clears throat> With any luck, that thing will not ring. If it does, we've got problems. <laughs> so I just wanted to demonstrate that even not in airplane mode, by putting your phone in a Faraday bag, you can isolate it. Yep, strange voicemail. Nobody heard my phone ring. So that's what it does. It isolates it from the network. <clears throat> as soon as you take it out of that bag, as soon as you open the bag, it has the possibility of talking to the outside world. Okay? They make a new Faraday bag that actually has the cable coming off of it, and that cable is insulated as well. Because what do you think would happen on an Apple device when you plug in your power cable? What does that become? What? Say it, you're right. Yes, it does. You're absolutely correct. That cable becomes an extension of the antenna. So if I've got my phone in the Faraday bag and 
let's just say I've got it pretty well closed up except the little corner for the cable to run out. What have I essentially done? Put an antenna on it. Okay? So think about radio frequency when you're dealing with these devices. First thing, airplane mode. Second thing, Faraday bag. Okay? You can go on the internet and look these up. There are ranging quality of Faraday bags. Okay? If you're not spending at least 50 bucks on a Faraday bag, I question how effective it will be. Okay? There are thin copper bags out there that are they call Faraday bags. You throw an Apple device in them and you will ring through them. Okay? And that's scary. That's the last thing you want to happen. Because you can corrupt data. The owner of the phone could be sending a white coat to it. Um, they could be locating it, finding you, all those types of concerns. So <clears throat> that covers, we walked in, grabbed the phone, we got the unlock code, put it in airplane mode, isolate it with Faraday back. Okay? Now we're going to take it back to the lab and we're going to analyze it. Okay? We're going to try to pull as much information out of that phone as we can without corrupting or modifying it in the process. Okay? Remember I said earlier about the whole Hippocratic Oath, do not harm? Same principle. You want to get as much as you can without manipulating it and causing changes. Okay? That being said, there are two areas specifically of a mobile device that you're going to focus on. System and user. Okay? The system area of the phone, we all understand that. It's the operating system, okay? whether it be Android or iOS. It's the operating system that runs the phone, it's responsible for your network connections, it's the underlying um, um, software that's responsible for security. Okay? And then you have user area. User area would be where your data is stored. Okay? Your profiles for Google Chrome, your profiles for the different web browsers you have on there, the profiles for the applications like Snapchat and Tinder and Grindr and all these crazy social media dating apps. Okay? They're all stored in user area. All right? And when we go through this... Uh, um, explanation of what happens when we hook the phone up to the cell bright. It's just basically a uh, touch screen computer. And when you start it up and you connect the phone to this side, it has a wizard. Okay? It's a step by step wizard asking you what's the make and model of the phone you're connecting to me. Okay? If it's a newer phone, it has an auto detect feature. So when you plug the phone in, in a powered on state, it will go ahead and try to recognize it. Okay? And then you have to verify that that is in fact the correct phone, and then go to the next step. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Heads nod, that works. Okay. So, <clears throat> direct your attention to the screen. I'm going to kind of go through the process here. <clears throat> what happens when you press the button? All right? So I, I, we've done everything to isolate the phone, we got it back to the lab, and we have it hooked up to the cell bright, and now we're ready to start pulling information off of it, all right? Okay. So once the machine has detected the phone, it's going to give me some options, okay? Those three options are the ways that I can extract information from the device. The first method that I have available to me is logical. Okay? Logical is only pulling from the phone data that is written to the file system that is marked active. Okay, so this is not deleted information. A logical extraction is going to pull data as it exists and active on the phone. Okay? So we're going to get SMS, we're going to get contacts, we're going to get call logs, we're going to get some media, pictures, video, that type of thing, and some of the application data. All right? The application data, it's hit or miss in the logical extraction. All of the applications in the iOS and Android markets are getting more and more privacy concerned, and so they are leaving less information in this app data area for a forensic examiner to pull out. Okay? So we have a, a burner phone. Okay, uh, um, You go down to Walmart and you buy the prepaid minutes and it's a cheaper Android device. Um, may not have a lot of security features um, and not a lot of privacy protections. Logical and file system 
are typically the only ways that I can process those cheaper phones because the vendor has locked them. Okay? Lock them not by security, lock them by hardware. Okay? We all understand that USB is the modern revision of serial communications and that you can change the pinout in a USB cable just like you used to a serial cable. Are we all with me so far? Yep, a couple of you shaking your hands. All right, so if the vendor like Vodphone or some other prepaid service, when they buy a million Android devices and they bring them to their lab, they open them up and they actually change the pinout for the wiring in the USB port. So it, you can't physically make a connection to do anything more than maybe a logical or file system extraction. All right? So it's kind of a down, downside to those prepaid devices. The vendor tries to lock them down and restrict them as far as what the user can do with them. All right? The reason they do that is they don't want the user to flash the firmware. Okay? If you're a prepaid service, why would you want the end user to be able to erase your operating system and put their own operating system on the phone and maybe take it to another vendor? Okay? They're trying to protect their, pro their profits. Okay? That's why they're doing it. So, <clears throat> passive prepay burner stuff, let's get into a, a modern phone, uh, a basic Apple or a more advanced Android device like uh, a Huawei or a Samsung uh, or the Apple iPhones. Okay? The file system is going to get you a little bit more um, than the logical extraction, and then it's going to get you the files as they exist on the file system. Okay? Not the deleted stuff yet, but all the files in the file system, not just the local application data. Okay? So you're going to get a little bit more out of the file system capture than you do the logical capture. Okay? Depending upon the security and the way the phone is set up, it's a, usually this is a good starting point. Okay? If I know the phone, I have it open, I'm past the lock code, I would typically try a file system first, just because it nets me a little more information. Final and third capture method is physical. Physical gets you as close to normal computer forensic setups of a bit stream copy of the file system in your phone. So this is going to get everything. This is going to get hidden files. This is going to get deleted data. Okay? This method is the best, it gets you the most information, but unfortunately it's getting to be the toughest to do because the phone vendors are locking this out, leaving me only file system and logical extractions to be able to pull data from the phone. Okay? I have a, a, a capture that Matt and I did on a university phone that I'm gonna pull up and show you guys so we can actually see all those different categories and the types of information we get off the phone. Okay, everyone with me so far? Awesome. All right. Okay, so this is a uh, Samsung. Looks like it was a Galaxy S3 um, that Matt had given me that belonged to uh, a university staff person who used it as their work phone. Right? So there's not any personal information on here. If you do see an email address, or something like that, just please be mindful of others' privacy. So, first things that we need to establish. What type of capture did we do? We did a physical capture. Uh, based on what I just got done telling you, we were able to get everything off that phone. So we're gonna have a very comprehensive information set to look at, okay? What's the next thing that we have? Um, identification, okay? Maybe what time zone it is, the serial number of the phone, identifying characteristics, um, it's a little bit fuzzy up there, but the things that it shows is the time in which the extraction happened, the method in which the extraction was done, and then some verifications. How many of y'all know what hash sums are? Anybody know what a hash sum is? MD5, SHA-1, SHA-2? Okay, I'm going to step back just a little bit and give you guys an understanding of that. Hash sums, mathematical equation, applied to a file, so that I know if I make a copy of it, it is identical, or if I want him to have a copy of the file that I have, and we are separated by distance, and he downloads it off the internet, I can send him the hash sum to compare to the file that he downloaded to make sure it's identical to the copy that I have. Okay? It's a reproducible scientific way to validate 
information. Why would that be important? It would be important because if I, an independent examiner, would capture a phone and I wanted to hand that over to law enforcement or vice versa, law enforcement has done a capture and they want to hand it over to me, the independent expert, to verify, that hash sum is important to validate that the copy I gave them or the copy they gave me is identical and unedited. Are you with me on that so far? Okay, good. So that's one of the identifying characteristics in this extraction summary, or the hash sums, telling us that we made a valid copy. Okay? <clears throat> so it breaks it all down into categories over here on the left hand side. Um, it's kind of grainy, so I'll read them to you and kind of go through. So up at the top we have application usage. Application usage is a log, a running log, of the apps on your phone that you have opened and when you open them. So if I want to know that you opened up Snapchat at 9.32 on Friday morning, I can go to the application log, scroll down and find my Snapchat, and find out when the last time you opened it was. Right? Application log. Next one, contacts. We all know contacts. It's our address book in our phone. Um, there's going to be a copy of all the contacts that were stored to the device. And we have one note here that I want to start offering up at the top. So first we have two areas of contacts. We have Google contacts and we have native contacts. Okay? If you have an Android phone that you know you can store a contact locally to your phone and you can store a contact in your Google Cloud. This is the designation of the two so you can see which ones are which. All right? Total contacts in this phone was six, and there's this red number one there. That red number one means that it was one of the contacts that had been deleted. Okay? Who knows, maybe they fat fingered it when they were putting it in, or they're no longer friends with that person and don't want to call them anymore, so they deleted the contact. So from a quick view, you can see things that may have been deleted on the phone. So it's a quick way to see that. Um, Kind of handy if you're looking for deleted things to have a quick way to see that. So the next section, cookies. Uh, who all knows what cookies are? Cookies? Okay. Um, what's a cookie? It's information that's stored on the computer from the web browser. Okay. That's how I understand it. Yep, nope, that's a great explanation. Cookies can have lots of other nefarious uses. Um, Facebook, Google, other social media sites use those cookies to track where you go and what you do on the internet. So for example, if you have Facebook open in a tab and you open other tabs of uh, web pages, you are going to start seeing advertising in Facebook directly related to the cookies of the websites that you opened in multiple tabs. Okay? So those are some things that, you can, that cookies can do. So it's important to pay attention to those. Um, cookies are also another way to determine maybe web history. If a user had been surfing a lot in Chrome and they erased their web history and erased their temporary files, you can still find a lot of web history stored in cookies. Okay? Um, <clears throat> it does note if you have multiple browsers. So they, these are the cookies that were generated by Chromium browser. Obviously, if you had Opera or Firefox or Midori, any of those other browsers installed, it would be a category for each browser and their cookies. Device locations. Right? Device locations are areas that have been pinned while the GPS was on on the phone. Right? So I, I use the GPS on my phone a lot because I am directionally challenged and my wife makes fun of me. So if you did a cell phone dump of my phone, you are going to find a ton of locations because I pin locations that I want to go in my phone. Right? These are not necessarily locations that the phone has always been. These are locations that um, you have used the GPS to find. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in this particular phone, the locations are directly tied to GPS coordinates. There are other location areas of a phone that can help you find someone. This area is specific to the GPRS radio inputs. 
Okay. Next session, device users. Okay. If you have set up multiple users on a device, this is where you would see that notation. Um, Apple devices are a little more friendly, especially their tablets, um, the iPads, for setting up multiple user accounts and, and being able to share them. You would see user accounts there. Um, emails. So it would seem that this user had at least two, possibly three, um, email accounts tied to this phone. Um, Stephone at gmail.com, and I can't read that one really well. Girl Scout STEM1 at gmail.com. So those were the two uh, email addresses that they had tied to this phone. Um, and again, we have a red notation here on this first email address showing that we have 15 deleted emails that we could look at if we wanted to. Okay. So that's kind of handy. Next area, installed applications. This is going to give you a list of all the applications that were installed on the phone, when they were installed, and some of their configuration. Okay. Really happy. easy to help understand how the user was using their device, uh, maybe applications that were installed, if you're trying to find a piece of malware or spyware that may have been installed on the phone that doesn't show up in the app list, this is going to be a more comprehensive view of all the apps on the phone. Notes. Um, this was a Samsung device, so we have some S memos. Um, it looks like we've got some pictures of mountains and kids and just most of these actually look like the default. Oh, no, that's a, that's not a default one. Um, some default notes that were in there. Passwords. Any password that you had stored in the device. Wi-Fi connection passwords. Web browser passwords. Individual app passwords are all stored in the password category. Okay? We see we have a deleted one here. It looks like they had entered any credentials for a site. They no longer wish to keep them, but they're still cached on the phone. Powering events. This is a system log when the phone was shut down and turned on. Search items. So when you go to the Play Store and you look for an app, this is where that's going to show up. User accounts are accounts that may be tied to multiple profiles. So if you look here, you can see the first email address, the Girl Scout <coughs> STEM1, and then the second email address is the CSIT phone. Um, and then it looks like we had a CSIT phone at gmail.com. So we've got a couple different uh, Google Talk, uh, Gmail, and um, IMAP, SMTP connections um, happening with this phone uh, for user accounts. Web bookmarks. Web bookmarks are pretty self-explanatory. If you open up a browser and you mark it as a favorite, it's going to show up in your web bookmarks. <clears throat> web history. Web history is going to contain the history of all the web surfing that you had done on the device, no matter what browser you use. Okay? You can see here we've got some deleted items. So the user tried to clear this entry from their history. It's not gone. It's right there. I can see it. Deleting information from a mobile device is not like deleting information from a computer. Manufacturers of these devices use as cheap components as they can possibly find so that you can afford them. The type of memory that is used in cell phones is not designed to be written to a lot. Okay? You'll wear it out. Have to go get a new phone. So in order to combat that, Android and iOS both are very conservative in how much they write back to that phone as to not wear it out. Does that make sense? You see how that could be a problem if you're trying to delete something? Yep. Okay. So keep that in mind. Um, what are the things that Apple has done to kind of counter that? How do we make sure that we have some privacy and that our information is truly deleted? Apple is getting to where each application has its own key pair for signing. So even though the file system is encrypted, each app is beginning to have its own encryption key to protect the data that may be within that own application. 
So when you delete things inside an application in the Apple ecosystem, there is more likely of a possibility that that data is truly gone. Does that make sense? Okay. So moving on to the next section, wireless networks. All right. These are the wireless networks that this phone has been connected to and the password for them. Um, what are some interesting things you could think of we could do with wireless networks on campus? I'm the system administrator. I have a map in my office that has every access point on campus. If I know that my phone's been connected to campus Wi-Fi, I'm going to go to the system area of the phone, and I'm going to look at the log for Wi-Fi connections. If at 8.30 in the morning, you walk into the building and your phone associates with AP 117.13 in the hallway, and you see a log in the phone connecting to the next access point, connecting to the next access point, what could I do? I could actually follow your footsteps as you walk through the building. Building a map of where you were at with nothing but the metadata of the wireless networks that you are connected to. Okay, that makes sense? Okay, on to the next one. Data files. <clears throat> Applications. So here is a, the running list of user installed and functioning applications. So we've got 46 deletions, which means the user installed 46 apps that they didn't like and uninstalled. Audio. Audio, this is the music the user downloaded, right? MP3s um, that have been, or AUG files. Um, some of the AUG files are system files, your ringtones and such that you may have on your phone, or the MP3s that you download. Configurations. Configurations are going to be the more intimate understanding of each app configuration and how it's set up. Databases. A lot of your individual applications talk to a localized database. For example, Snapchat uses a SQLite database to store its information in. Okay. I have parsed all the information on this phone. Snapchat, the application, obfuscates or hides the data that it stores. But if I have access to the raw database and I know how to query a SQLite, what do I now have? All the stuff Snapchat's trying to hide from me. So there are always multiple layers to an application. And if you think as an engineer, how do I get under that next layer? All right, take that into consideration. Documents, documents pretty self-explanatory. These would be in a uh, notepad, wordpad, word, um, uh, library, office documents that may have been created or stored on the device. Images. Images is broken down into two categories, system and non-system. System images are all the icon, all the icons and uh, GIFs and different uh, things that you see on your screen. Those would be the, the system images. Non-system images would be the ones that your apps were responsible for downloading, maybe icons or little, uh, you know, the little mouse ears that you can put on your face. Those are all images stored on your phone um, that, that you'd be able to see here. Um, and then also the non-system images are going to be pictures that you take with your phone. Um, everything is broken down into size, metadata, path, name, type, all that type of thing. And you can search through all of those. Videos. Videos are self-explanatory. A video that was taken from the phone or a video that was downloaded from the internet. <clears throat> Carving. When you're able to do a physical extraction of a phone, which means you copied all the binary data off of the memory device, you can use a forensics tool called Carving. Carving is a method of going in and looking at partial files to see if you can reassemble them. Okay? How many of you have ever seen a partially deleted picture? Okay? It had, it's green and fuzzy across the top, but you can still make out everything below it. Do you know how that happens? OK. 
Okay, we're going to talk about file systems for a little bit. Don't files are deleted. I took a picture of a tree. It had a robin in it. Okay, it was a great big picture. Crystal clear. I loved it. The next day, that robin was in a different position in the tree, and I liked it better, so I took a picture of the, of the, the, the robin in the tree in a better place. Okay? My phone was full, so it began to overwrite the file that was already there from yesterday. So if I have a great big image stored on the file system, and it's occupying several sectors of space, and I take a new file, and I put it over top of that, well, I haven't destroyed the old file completely. There's still remnants of it left. And so that's why when you pull up a deleted image, you may see part of it, or it'll look really grainy or out of tune like an old TV when they, they make the wavy lines across them. Okay? So that may, that's what can happen when you partially delete an image file, or you only overwrite a section of it, is you'll see a little bit of it. The rest of it will come out grainy or not really visible. So just some things to think about. Carving is going in and looking at those partially erased files to see if it can't reproduce the whole thing. Okay. And back to our file system discussion. If I have a file system that allocates 4K per sector, and the image that I took was 16K, so I'm covering four blocks, and my phone is full and I need to start overriding or deleting things, the new photo that I take is only 12K. Right? Well, it's not going to cover as many logical blocks or sectors on that hard drive, is it? So there's going to be a leftover or slack. Okay? Carving is looking at that slack space to determine if we can reproduce more of that overwritten image. Okay, so it's looking through those deleted files and it's doing some comparison and hashing to see if it can reassemble them. Okay. On a Windows computer, there's uh, a tool called Volume Shadow Copy. Okay. Volume Shadow Copy is a way to store the metadata of the files that are over top of it. And that would be maybe give you a, good, a better understanding of what carving is doing, is it's going in and it's looking at that metadata under the file system, saying how much of this can I recreate. So that's carving. That is a high level overview of a physical extraction of a phone and the type of data that you would get out of it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, on those passwords, are they actually uh, plain text? Yes. More and more of the applications are beginning to salt and hash their passwords so they're not stored in plain text anymore, but you are correct. Most of them are. So that, as an investigator, and I want to build a profile of the person's phone that I'm extracting, if I can pull out their passwords for social media, Facebook, Google, Yelp, wherever it is that they're posting to, and I have them in plain text, I now can go to the judge and be like, hey, not only did I get the phone and all the information and connections off of it, but he's talking to his buddies about their drug deal on these other channels, can I have a warrant to look into those other things? Okay? To get a lot of information. And some of those have to be stored in plain text, so if you connect to a wireless network, it has to have the plain text password for when you join that wireless network again. In home situations here, where we have to sign in, it's a different type of authentication. Yep. So, Apple devices. Apple devices are becoming more and more difficult simply because Apple keeps increasing their security, which is great. I am a privacy advocate and a little bit of a digital anarchist, so I have no problems with that. But that being said, working in a professional environment, interfacing with law enforcement, and trying to make ethical decisions, sometimes those increased privacy controls <clears throat> inhibit a thorough investigation. Okay? So think about that. Think about the ramifications of it. Privacy is a good thing. It can also be a bad thing when you're trying to investigate criminal behavior. I personally do not subscribe to the thought that there should be open encryption. The whole concept of responsible encryption scares me to the bone. That being said, I understand the unique challenges that our government and law enforcement have when trying to 
get enough information to make good investigations. Okay? Understanding your rights as to when law enforcement can or cannot touch your phone, what they can force you or compel you to give them, and what you can't, are things that I want you to study and read about. Okay? If you've been involved in criminal activity, and the officer in charge has reasonable cause, you have to give him your phone. Now, you do not have to give him the passcode for it. But, if you have used your fingerprint or your ugly mug as a way to unlock your phone, that falls under biometrics, and law enforcement can force you to put your thumb on the phone or put the phone to your face to unlock it. Law enforcement cannot compel you to give them their passcode, because it's something that you know. It is not something that you have or can produce. Okay? Now, if a law enforcement officer has a probable cause and means to go to a judge and say, hey judge, I know for a fact that there is contraband material on the phone, or he has been using the phone in the commission of criminal activity, that judge can now go to you and say, hey, Mr. Bob Smith, um, the government has demonstrated that uh, there are concerns of criminal behavior involved in your phone. You have to give them their passcode. At that point, you have some choices. You can give them the passcode, unlock your phone, now they have all the information, or you can choose to not. If you choose to not, most likely the judge is going to throw you in jail for not obeying his orders or contempt. Okay? So think about those types of things. My best practice would be probably don't do stupid things with your phones. If you're going to commit a criminal act, leave it at home. You don't need it. <laughs> okay? Just things to think about. I care about your guys' privacy. I care about your rights. You need to know them and understand them so that you can behave appropriately. Okay? You're approached by law enforcement. There is suspicion of wrongdoing. What should be your first action? To get a lawyer. That's a good one. Lawyer. Lawyer. I cannot repeat that enough. It is important that you know your rights and you ask for legal counsel immediately. Okay. Back to the Apple devices. Um, one of the tools that the self the Silverite uses to extract information out of the Apple phones is an API hook into iTunes. Okay? So the computer that I use to forensically capture Apple devices has a copy of iTunes installed, and it's using the, the iTunes connection to the phone to um, extract a backup of that device. Okay? When it comes to the Apple devices, <clears throat> there really isn't necessarily a separation between logical, file system, and physical. By the design of the Apple device, you are asking the phone to create a backup of its data into an individual file. And that's what you end up with, okay? as they are written to the file system. So a lot of times in Apple devices, I'm not able to pull or retrieve a lot of deleted items. Because once the Apple file system marks the file as deleted, when you go to do a backup, the backup goes, oh, that file's deleted. You don't need it. So you don't get a copy of it. So that's kind of a unique challenge with the Apple devices. Um, Apple devices, if you can circumvent their encryption and security, they log, archive, and keep more information about users and how the phone is used than Androids do. So as far as from a forensic perspective of how much information will I get out of an Apple device, if I can get past the encryption, if I can get past the user code and get a good backup, I am going to net more metadata out of an Apple device than I would an Android, simply because the Android system doesn't log as much as the Apple device does. Okay. Um, Google is similar to the Apple device. Um, they like to log a lot of their stuff. The system logging area of the Google phones are always very interesting. You should dump one, take a look at it. Um, they talk to Google as about as much as an Apple phone talk to Apple. It's, it's just a constant conversation. So take those things into consideration as well when you're thinking about your devices. Any questions?
kind of a fire hose. I know it dumped a lot of stuff at you. Um, did any of it scare you? Like, oh, wow, yeah, that's not how I'm going to use my phone anymore. Yeah, a little bit. I see some smiles, maybe some, yeah, I didn't know you could get that back. Yes, you can, and you should be concerned. Think about your use, okay? Have the integrity and ethics to use your electronic devices in a means that doesn't violate you. Question? Go ahead. If you were on a case, did you ever find something on the phone that led to another conviction than what they were originally um, I am typically always working for defense, okay. and yes, I have been involved in cases that involve multiple people, okay? Whether it is a drug running operation, and uh, I busted you with, you know, the law enforcement busted you with marijuana, and uh, took your phone and went through your contacts and saw that the last eight people that you text messages had something to do with weights and measures of marijuana. Yeah, they're going to follow that up. Yes. Um, metadata collection and enumeration of relationships. Okay? That's the next step of what you would do with the information gleaned from a phone. Okay? I'm going to take all of your contacts, your recently calls, and your um, recent SMS messages, and I'm going to put them in a database, and I'm going to compare them to my known drug intelligence database. And I'm going to start building relationships. Yes, that's how that happens. That's how larger organizations are, are discovered and enforcement taken upon them. So yeah. Have you ever been taking information off of a phone and felt in danger? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, it wasn't in the context of criminal behavior. Um, this was a divorce case I was assisting um, a, a, an attorney with. Um, the wife was in a very abusive relationship, um, and she was trying to remove herself from the control of this gentleman. Um, she, she had been monitored with malware on the phone. He had installed spyware on her laptop to track her locations. And so, you know, after we discovered these things, we obviously wanted to remove them. Well, in the process of doing so, um, I goofed. I made a mistake. I was working on the phone. When you hook a, uh, an Android up to the Cellbrite, you have to enable um, uh, USB debugging and you have to tell it not to scan applications that might get installed through that USB debugging interface. When well, in the process of doing that, I accidentally took it out of airplane mode. I received a flash alert on the phone. 13403 Carpenter Street, you better have my phone, I'm coming for you. <laughs> well, luckily that's not my real address. <laughs> the GPS did not resolve as my home address, it resolved as a house next door. So that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, very much I would, uh, I mean, I don't have children at home, but it is my wife and I. Um, I am a bit of a pacifist when it comes to the whole firearms thing. Um, I, I am committed to service, and if I am shot and killed, then I no longer have service to worry about. So I'm a little bit of a pacifist in that aspect, that I'm, I'm not going to be meeting you at the front door with a pistola. I'm probably going to let you do whatever you feel you need to do. So yes. Um, those are concerns and things to be worried about. You can see from a law enforcement perspective or in a defense counsel scenario where you may be working with organized crime, gangs, people of means and money, that you can start to have concerns if you aren't ethical and responsible and trustworthy. Very much so. Are there cases where defense counsel come to me and said, Sean, can you help us with this? And I felt that maybe it was gray ethically, and I said, no, thank you. I know that you have a $5,000 check sitting there waiting for me, but I would prefer to stay on the ethical correct side of law and defense than do something shady. You guys are going to have to make those kinds of decisions too. Okay. Well, Question. I think that's time. That's time? Okay, I'll so show up. Why don't we thank Sean for talking to us today.